Welcome to Bastion and Broadcasting, where tonight we are doing something different. It's the first week where I've not had the Electric Bastion and PDF up on my screen. And in fact, I will not be directly referencing um, Electric Bastion and PDF tonight because we are looking at a word that is not a real word Bastion Spiration, i.e., Bastion Land inspiration, uh, stuff that I kept in mind. People have kept asking me about an Appendix N type thing for Electric Bastion Land. So they make the mistake of assuming that I'm literate and saying, what books would you say are, you know, good reference material for Electric Bastion Land? And then I say, well, I don't really, I'm not very good at reading novels, to be honest. So I don't have a huge list of books to recommend and then they say what um well how about a music playlist and then i sort of remember that i'm like really uncool with my music <laughs> choices so i felt like i to struggle through some music recommendations but it got me thinking like well where have i actually drawn inspiration from because i can't have just come up with this stuff out of nowhere and i think there are bits of it from like film tv from other games but I thought about something, it, for some reason I, I came back to a PC game that I played years ago and I first played this game, in fact I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the game up and then I'll talk about why this game is relevant um, <clears throat> to Electric Bastion Land but, but mainly the main thing I want to do today is I'm going to reload this game up that I've not touched in a number of years, I'm going to talk about some of the design behind it and how I have kept that how i took that to heart for some of the design for into the odd especially and then electric bastion land it's not a direct one-to-one -one reference but there's certain elements in here that i think have really um really affected the way that i have designed these games so the game is well i'm cheating actually because the game that i played originally was a game called Neat Stories. That's K-N-Y-T-T. -T. And uh, that was a game that was released in, I think, 2007 by Niflas Games. As far as I'm aware, I think it was just the work of like one designer. But Neat Stories, and I'm not sure in the pronunciation, I think it's Swedish. So if we have any Swedes in the chat, if you can help me out, K-N-Y-T-T. -T. Um, what I've done is uh, Neat Stories was sort of a sequel to a game called Neat which I have not actually played um, so I will now hopefully <laughs> fingers crossed be able to cut to the game of Neat I will be putting my headphones on like a real streamer <clears throat> because the soundtrack is um is a big part of the appeal here i would say so let me make sure i can hear okay right we're in so neat is um a game that i played i'm gonna i'm gonna do one one ear on one ear off because um <clears throat> when i have two ears on I, uh, I end up shouting. This isn't going to work. Um, <laughs> this is a game that um, it kind of does for 2D platformers what I was trying to do with Into the Odd in that it takes it down to a very core essence of a particular part of what makes platforming games interesting and it really hones in on that and makes that the main thing. So let's have a go. In fact, I, I, I've not played this before, but I am going to go and we're going to go through the tutorial. Oof, is that incredibly loud? Yeah, let's, let's, let's take this right down. Um, so as you can see, all you've got is left and right, and you've got a very simple, uh, pixel graphics oh 
S will give me a jump. I, I'm, I'm already ditching these headphones for now. Um, S will give you a little jump and left and right will move you. And you'll see as I go that this, this it already looks a lot like other platform games, you know, things like Super Meat Boy, um, Celeste, um, some of those sort of really difficult challenge based platformers but it's actually something a little bit different so I'm just gonna uh, jump over here climb as well and it's doing the classic tutorial thing of not letting me get through here without realizing that I can climb and that I can wall jump um, okay yeah so I can do like a proper wall jump like that. There we go. There's save points. And oh, okay, so this is something that is different to neat stories. You know what? We're gonna go we're gonna go no sound because I can see this is gonna cause problems. Um so this is already different from knit stories. When I hold the A key, you'll see the direction you need to the nearest item which you need to pick up. And the Q shows me a list of items that I'm trying to collect. So it's a platform game where you're trying to collect items that are scattered across a world. Um, and that's the whole tutorial. Okay, so it's actually even simpler than, than Knit Stories. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play a little bit of the original, talk about it, and then I'm gonna go to Knit Stories. But um, like I say, this isn't just gonna be me playing a video game. I'm not turning into a video game streamer. Um, what I want to do is I want to look at some of the design of this game and how it can be applied to role-playing games, um, especially Electric Bastion and Into the Odd, and especially to do with like environment, designing your environment and planning your adventures and establishing a mood for your players. So... Um, so, Jogirius asks, were you looking for tabletop RPG inspiration when you played this, or was it something that percolated and formed later? Um, I will tell you the answer to that once this unskippable cutscene, which is not something I'm thrilled at. Okay. Um, so... I can already tell you, I'm going to make a prediction having not played this before. Some of these little, some of these games have like an intro like this. So I've been abducted by an alien. It's an unskippable, uncontrollable cutscene, non-interactive cutscene, I should say. And I can already tell you that I think the game will be better without this cutscene. So, yep, yeah, the spaceship's crashed. And, yeah, it's crashing. And, um, okay, I think we now have control. Yeah, so, would the game have been any worse if we started now? If this was the opening scene? It's kind of like show, don't tell. Like, I'm next to a crashed spaceship. There's a little alien guy there. And there's bits of wreckage around. And I know from the tutorial that I've got to collect these parts. We don't need a cutscene, so... I'm not going to come on here and slam this game because I'm picking it because I like it. So I'm going to keep it positive other than that. But the cutscene thing is not a good start. Um, but when I originally played this game, um, or rather Neat Stories, the sequel, I wasn't looking specifically for tabletop RPG inspiration. No, this uh, I remember downloading this game, I can't remember how I came across it, around 2009. Um, and it really connected with me just because it's so, it was so unique and it was, I, at the time I was working as a teacher and I was kind of unhappy in the job I was doing. Uh, and it was one of the few games that is, has a small enough footprint. It, it I, I'm full screen now, but it runs in a little window, um, a tiny little window on your desktop. And it's got incredibly low footprint in terms of memory you can run it on anything. So I remember having it on my, my crappy work laptop. And then when I got home from a bad day's work, um, I I would play this and listen to some music and relax. 
um, and something about it just stuck with me. So my memory of these games is that they are very open-ended. You are dropped in and it's kind of an opposite to the classic, like if you remember the first level of like Super Mario Brothers. Um, the thing that people always point out is that, you know, Mario starts here. He starts on the left and he's facing right, which means people tend to think, I'm gonna go right. But here you started in the middle and you've got four different exits from the screen you can take and you can access all of them. So this is what I'm saying about how it's kind of useful for like, when you're thinking about your dungeon design, do you want it to be like a Mario gauntlet where you just go from left to right? Or if you want a true sense of exploration, give them options of where to go. So I'm gonna go up here because it's high and the contrarian in me always likes to go left in platform games. So looking at this game now, it's incredibly simple. All I'm doing is moving around the environment. The jumps that I'm making aren't particularly challenging. Um, this isn't, like I said, this isn't Super Meat Boy or any of those uh, games that are really set to push your platforming ability to the limit. Um, I mean, the, the challenge is kind of almost non-existent at the minute, I would say. Uh, you can die, so if you go in the water, you die and you go back to the save point with nothing lost. Um, but the controls, and it's difficult to get this across by watching it. Uh, I should have said this game's free, so if you search for Knit or Knit Stories, I'll type it in the, uh, in the chat so people can see how it's spelt. Uh, the actual original designer's website is no longer existent from what I can see, but there are um, there are other websites that have hosted it that you can download from. Um, the thing that's, that makes it work is the control is so good and the environment is kind of compelling uh, without being over the top. It uses lots of negative space but the fact that you always have a couple of options. So here it's like, yeah, I can go under, I can go over, I can go down here. You've always got options of where to go. Um, and for me, this little, you know, very simple platform game has given me more sense of exploration than some big AAA open world games. Like, you know, your, your Grand Theft Autos and Red Dead Redemption, things like that, that sort of purport to have this huge open world. Or even like online games, like your World of Warcraft and stuff. Uh, I'm not gonna say this world is one to rival these huge 3D worlds, but it is, there is a certain purity to it. Like all you are doing at the moment is exploring now. Oh, and there's a save point. Now, I don't know specifically in this game whether it's exactly the same as with Knit Stories, but I'm gonna carry on for a bit and see if I can progress a little bit. So you, you kind of reach these dead ends like here where there's a, so there's a save point, yeah. And then there's the top of the mountain and that's it. And these dead ends, it's kind of like, that the fact that the dead ends exist make it more rewarding when you don't hit a dead end. And that sounds like it's excusing like really bad, boring dungeon design where you've got lots of dead ends. But I think a well-placed dead end <laughs> can, can be quite effective, um, especially if it's not just literally a dead end. Like here, you've at, they've at least rewarded me slightly by giving me this feeling of having reached the top of the mountain. And I can at least go down either side. And even though the control, the, the challenge is so low, like I, the risk of me actually falling in this water, even if I fall down, I'm gonna catch myself. There is a certain satisfaction to doing these easy things and just getting better at them. It's kind of like parkour. It sounds ridiculous to say that, but like as you get to grips with the controls, you sort of, 
get in the zone and just crossing a very simple screen like this is, is kind of comforting in itself. So this is people think about dungeon design and the temptation is to fill every inch of the dungeon with things that want to kill you or you know crazy treasures and make this kind of the funhouse dungeon as it's sometimes called but here you've got lots of empty space and there's been a lot written about the idea of empty rooms in dungeons in OSR style play um, in the original well BX rather Dungeons and Dragons there was a lot of uh, I forget which 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 version of basic it was but there was a sort of dungeon generation table and it would spit out a lot of empty rooms which empty rooms sound completely alien to a certain school of dungeon designer because you know you want to fill your dungeon with things empty room is just like you walk in and it's an empty room but it shouldn't be an empty room it's just an, a room that isn't trying to kill you or trying to reward you or doing a combination of both so this here is an empty room there is a tiny little bit of threat here but really it, this is an empty room it's there as a pacing mechanism it lets you catch your breath it lets you just move through and you know experience the passage of time and again i've reached a dead end and i should have been using this so I have this pointer which will point me towards what I should be heading towards. So I've gone in completely the wrong way, but you know what, I'm not even mad because it's just such a joy to, to move through this world. And this time at least, I can take a different path back because there's always different paths. Um, so it's, you know, it's pointing me down here, let's go. And this is the other thing that I really liked about it was You've always, the, the, I love this kind of, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what exactly it's called, but when you have the non-scrolling screen, so each screen is like a self-contained, if I want to be really wanky, I could call it like a self-contained painting sort of thing. Um, and you, you're not scrolling around, you can, you can, just, t you can just enjoy the, the background. It's all very simple, but I do find it weirdly, like we were just up on a mountain and now we're going down into these caves and we can go even deeper and it's getting darker there's a lot of very it's, it's easy to look at this and think it was very simple but there's a lot of very subtle work gone into the environment design in these games so i'm going down oh right okay and i genuinely feel like i'm going down into the into the darkness here see my, my thing is pointing elsewhere but i'm gonna persevere because i just want to explore this world now the other thing you might have noticed is so far there's been some water but there's not been any enemies and i'm not entirely sure how this i'm not entirely sure what's happening with enemies in this game uh i like i say my reference point is from knit stories i've not i've not played this edition before so we'll see what happens but so far we've not had any enemies we've not had any power-ups there's no coins to collect all i'm trying to collect is these nine things which i think once i collect them all i win the game basically um, so Jagerius has picked up something um, which I wanted to move on to soon so yeah I'm, I'm saying all this stuff about how how well this game evokes exploration and atmosphere but it won't work if you try and just describe this game to your players at the table will it because you can try and describe this you know this this cool scene here but really <clears throat> it, it's, a, it's a completely different medium there's no visual other than whatever props you bring to the table or any artwork you have it's not there's no visual medium uh, to role-playing games really tabletop role-playing games it's, it's more about the description so I don't think when I'm talking about taking lessons from this in terms of exploration I think the key things that you can take from it are the pacing where you've got long stretches where like look at this room here this room doesn't seem to serve much purpose but in Electric Bastion Land, there's a there's a section of when you're mapping the underground called stretches and stretches are sort of there to just 
create space between two sections of the underground basically and to sort of to show that it's been a long journey and little areas like that if you just say to your players yes well you, you move forward and then there's a little climb upwards and you climb up and then there's another climb and then you move forward and you move down that's not interesting so with a tabletop role-playing game i do think you can't just have a straight up empty <laughs> room like this and it won't have the same thing because even though it's empty i'm you know i'm doing stuff i'm moving around and even though it's easy i reach the end and a little part of me is like okay cool i crossed that room so you can put quite straightforward challenges into your dungeon like you could have almost no brainers i think um like having a river and there's no obvious way to cross um except for there is um there's a, a sort of a little banged up boat in a jetty but there's no ore on the boat so they've got to find something to use as an ore now this is dead straightforward they'll probably have something in their backpacks they could use as an ore or they'll probably have a pole or there's, there's that's probably not going to stump them for a long time but in doing that it's this kind of low-key i don't want to say relaxing really but it's this kind of it's the it's the the steady quiet uh progression through the dungeon that means when things do get more extreme later on you get the contrast so here again look um i'm facing a relatively simple challenge here and then I'm given a bit of breathing space. But I'm faced with a choice, and this is another thing that I like to have in dungeons. Now, if I drop down here, I won't be able to get back up. And I can see that my objective is up there. So do I head back, knowing that this is kind of a one-way trip, or do I risk going forwards? And this sort of thing is used... So I have played Dark Souls quite a lot way back when that first came out on like the ps2 but i think the i think dark souls does this quite a lot with sort of when you uncover that there's like quite a few one-way passages from what i remember and sort of you open up a shortcut that connects two areas that weren't connected before little things like that are worth thinking about for your dungeon you don't have to you if you just make it so that everything is connected straight away and everything is two-way traffic it can feel a little bit straightforward so having these one-way trips it creates a real moment of tension because i know that i've got to commit to this and of course i'm going to do it um and uh, the reason that i keep running into these walls is i do remember something about there being like secret doors somewhere now if there was a secret door there i would not be crazy about that because you know why if you've read electric bastion land I don't like secret doors that you just find by prodding a random patch of wall because what does that encourage it encourages me walking around hugging every wall like an idiot so don't do that if there's a secret door make it visible and i'm back out and it feels good um so yeah let's let's go up here now i'm going to play this for another couple of minutes then i'm going to go on to knit stories because there's a few elements that i think must have presumably come out come with that sort of second edition of the game if you like that i'd like to talk about but let's just play this for another five minutes and see ooh, see where it goes okay so we have signs of life now knit stories does something interesting ah before i do let's look at the chat sorry i'm neglecting the chat a lot today um oh so tacky says i kind of feel like you're not the painter as a gm conductor but more the muse for your players medium yes that does sound wanky i know but i i am guilty of that myself i think sometimes you can paint a broad stroke and the players will fill in the gaps is what really works i think so i could try and describe every uh every element of this room but if I describe it in more broad strokes, so if we look at this area over here on the left, it looks kind of like a kind of crystal caves type thing. So if I just say it's like a glistening 
sorry, a glittering, glittering? What's the word I'm after? Like a sparkling cake, sparkling grotto full of these multicolored gems. Then that's a very short description, but your mind is already filling the gaps pretty well. If I go on to say, oh, some of the gems are huge and orange and some of them are small and green, and uh, there's gems hanging from the, the ceiling and the floor, you can almost go too far and the players fixate on the little details that you're painting. When really, if I just say, imagine this cave, they'll start to fill in the blanks already themselves. Uh, Jogiria says, you talked about moving feels good for the platformer. Is there a direct analog for tabletop RPGs? Yes. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, well, actually that links in nicely to this area here. So I think these little guys are not dangerous. Yeah, okay. So I think in a platformer, the way that you interact with the game is you move and you jump and you explore the world. And that is like the, that is your way in to the world. That is the way that you interact with the game. As obvious as that sounds. With a tabletop RPG, the, the basic way that you interact with the game is by asking questions and doing things. It sounds very vague, but saying like my character does this. And I think the unique element of RPGs, which gets gets look, overlooked incredibly often, I think, for something that seems so obvious, the fact that you can do anything. And that was always, I think, the selling point for people who have never played a tabletop RPG before, is this tactical infinity where you can try anything. Now, in this little PC game here, I can't talk to these little creatures. I can't do it. But I'm not bothered. In the concept of a, in the context of this PC game, you know, they're a cool little bit of atmosphere and I can kind of imagine what noises they're making. I can just imagine being there and then I can move on with that as a nice little, nice little bit of atmosphere. If this was a role-playing game, what would the players do? They wouldn't just walk past and you say, oh, well, you can't talk to them. They would try and talk to these creatures. They would try and go in the house. They would be messing around and interacting with the world and poking and prodding at things. And I think that is the equivalent to the sort of feels good factor. When you do something that you couldn't do in an ordinary game, in an ordinary game, you do something that you couldn't do in a PC game or a video game or a, a board game. You do something Ex, like outside of the normal parameters of gameplay. So I think one of the classics is talking to someone, especially talking to someone that you're not meant to talk to. So there's an one of the failed careers in Electric Bastion and gets the ability to talk to animals. And one player had this and they went absolutely nuts talking to every animal they could. And they loved it. And every time they got even the slightest bit of reward, even if it was just like asking for directions from a pigeon, it, it was it was feeding that kind of feels good element. Some people would say that the feels good factor is rolling dice and getting big numbers. I think that is a feel good factor for some games. It's not what I play RPGs for. I think when I play them, I am thinking of them more like a weird combination of like escape room, murder mystery type thing <laughs> where you're, it's more about the problem solving and um, the sort of interacting with the world and asking questions. Ah, so, dead end. Now, in Knit Stories, you could unlock like double jumps and things like that, which I don't think you can do in this version. So, that's presumably a one way trip over there. Um, so, let me just see. Ah, well, let me just see if I can find any more signs of like hostility because. Let's go back to the surface then. And little things like the fact that you can see the light coming down. And I know that sounds really obvious because you would expect that from a, a video game. You'd expect to see the light coming in from the surface. But I think that's what feeds the sense of exploration. Like it really feels like you've gone a long way. Like I feel like I've been down into a cave and come back down. Oh, okay. What's this? So my interest is peaked. I'm presented with... You know what, this is actually kind of challenging. Well, not huge challenging, but... Oh, ah, right. Ah, so, 
One issue I do have with these games, if you've heard me ramble on before about information, choice and impact, I feel like sometimes these games have a slight lack of information. So I said before about the hidden doors. Um, here, I, I, I kind of assumed I could jump on top of these, uh, these like turrets, or parapets, or whatever they're called, but I couldn't. Uh, luckily, it wasn't too much of a fall down, but I would appreciate a slightly clearer bit of information there. Yeah, Jajiria says, um, exploration platformers have something cool that they share with Veins of the Earth by Patrick Stewart. They funnel you downward very often. It's still the same platform mechanics, but it does a good job of inserting claustrophobia without words or rails. Yeah, there's definitely elements of claustrophobia and like the opposite where being up in the sky and out in the open feels good. But because this is an open world, I know that if I drop down this gap, which I'm almost certain to do, I think now that I look at where I am, when I drop down, I'm going to land somewhere and it's not just going to be death. Let's see if I can, no way. Oh, okay. Now, I'm not crazy about these leaps of faith, but let's do it. Nope, not good. Ah, oh, I'm back here, look, with this guy. Okay, cool. Well, let's go this way and see what we can see. Yeah, so you, you get you get that sense of claustrophobia, and I think that's always a good thing to put into your players when you're underground. Really emphasise the difference between being underground and being back on the surface. Little things like the fact that the trees are moving gives the sense of feeling the air flowing around you, whereas underneath it's very still, and you're literally like moving out of the light and into the darkness. So let's not go up this tower this time. Um, also, Taki says, I think the feel-good factor is linked to how you can exercise your skill in most platforms. I think the ability to come up with novel interactions that shape the explorative space of the game is the good feel of RPGs. I think it is. I think it's just... Uh, this sounds like I'm being elitist, but I don't mean it so. I mean, I've, I think everyone can do this, but I think being smart is the feels good. Whereas with platformers, it's like being good at jumping around. And even that's something that I really like about this game. I'm not a a skillful player of any means but you just kind of get used to moving around and it's got like i say this weird parkour feeling where you're like you take joy in like even small little jumps oh here we go lava things are serious but even this is like it's very difficult to die but you still feel the sense of accomplishment and that might seem at odds with like the osr style of play where a, a lot of focus is put on challenge and I wouldn't want to play an RPG where everything is an absolute breeze like this. But I think this exemplifies that sort of empty room style where you're going to have areas of the game, areas of your dungeon where it's okay to just have them be, have them not have any monsters and have it be more of an atmospheric thing. Because the other advantage that RPGs have is that uh, whereas everything is fluff and everything is crunch so if we were in this area in this game as far as i can tell this area is completely i don't want to say pointless but it's a long flat bridge and a little drop down here the one thing that does make it interesting is i'm assuming that i'll be able to i might come up from the bottom of the screen at a later point so it's kind of given me a little sneak preview that there's more exploration to be had down from here but also the um if this were a role-playing game you couldn't just say yeah you're trapped on this bridge because the players would find a way to get through and the fact that there's trees the players might want to chop those trees down they might want to climb up the trees they might want to start a fire so an empty room is never an empty room as long as you put something in it and that might be the most most meaningless phrase i've ever said um, I started saying it before I rethought it out, but the idea being that an empty room in the sense of a room that doesn't have monsters or treasure or traps in it, as long as you fill it with some other stuff, be it just it's full of bugs or it's full of, it's overgrown with plants or it's just a narrow walkway over a hole, but it's easy to navigate. 
everything that you describe becomes a potential option to come back to later. Oh, right. So I walked straight into this thing. This is something that I quite like. There's a lot of wildlife in this game <laughs> that just kind of exists in the background and like I can't do anything to it. And this is the difference again. If this were an RPG, a tabletop RPG, the players would be trying to ride this thing, trying to tame it. They might just kill it because they assume it's a monster. But this game has a really interesting interaction with wildlife because you never know if something is deadly until you get right up next to it and touch it. Um, so it kind of it kind of gives you this like respect for nature <laughs> because even the smallest little animal, you are encouraged to approach them with caution. And at first, I thought that was kind of a design flaw. I thought, well, no, surely you should make you should make the dangerous animals like red or something. But I quite like that you you don't know, so you have to be cautious around them and and learn learn about the the animals in this environment. And again, we've got a nice little town where we can't really do anything, but it feels good. Although I think it's bullshit that you can see someone swimming when you can't swim. Is it going to let me swim in here? No. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a fan. That's that save point is clearly there for that exact purpose. Okay, so we I know I keep saying I'm going to quit, but it is, it is weirdly compelling to just move around this world. And again, subtle little things that it does to make you feel like you're progressing. Look at the background here. You can see the start of the mountain in the background. And then you can see the mountain going up and we oh, there is a volcano. Yeah, Georgius has that quote there. You can you can put that on my tombstone. Ah, nice. Underwater, where I can't go. Um Right, you know what? It's it's really hard to hard to quit. Let's get to one, let's get to the other side of the mountain. See what's there. Then I will move on to knit stories and talk about why. Okay, got a little bug. And yeah, and even the cactuses don't hurt you. Oh. Yep, yeah, you're friendly. Right, well I'm at a bit of a dead end anyway, so let's let's leave this here. Um and then I'm gonna move on to knit stories. Now, the idea behind knit stories, excuse me while I talk, while I sort out the uh, display because it's a little bit tricky. Um, the idea behind knit stories was, whereas knit was like one self-contained game, one self-contained like story, if you like. Knit stories is like, it's kind of like the Super Mario Maker for knit. So it had all the tools to make your own games and it um, it inspired a lot of interesting designs. Um, can I put this on my other screen? No, I can't. Let's see. Okay. Okay, it's all going wrong. Bear with me while I uh, open it up again. Right. Hmm. Does not want to be on the feed. Right, I'm going to have to do this, uh, slightly dodgy way there we go 
So you can't see, but I'm, I'm zoomed in like really far on the uh, on my um, desktop here uh, because this is a tiny little window. But this is the only way that I can get it to work for whatever reason for now. So Knit Stories was like Super Mario Maker. People could make their own stories within Knit and it inspired a lot of different um, takes on what to do with a very simple core rule set. And it's this idea that imitation, that limitation breeds creativity that I really like. And it's it's worth playing that there's like a, a standard level that comes with the game called the machine which is designed by uh, Niflas who is the the creator of the game again he's going to hit me with some exposition dump which I don't I'm going to speed through it because I'm already confident yep this is going to be better if I just go straight into it um, I can already tell that I start without the ability to climb and I start without the ability to, to run um, because one of the things that this game adds is the Metroidvania, as they call it, uh, progression. If you're unfamiliar, what that means is there are certain abilities that you will unlock. Um, so here, I don't yet have the ability to, to jump high enough to get up here and I can't climb up. So presumably at some point I'm going to get the ability to to climb or to jump higher and get up there. So I've got to remember this and then later I'll come back and go up there. Now, I hadn't realized that the original Knit didn't have this. I thought this was just like standard. But, what's this here? Ah, nice. That's the ability to run. Um, now, the advantage of having these kind of unlockable abilities are... It feels good when you get it and then you're like, oh, that's so much better. It's like I can breathe. But the disadvantage is that there's a lot of going back on yourself and remembering where you saw that little ledge. And for some people, that's great. But I quite like the idea that you can get anywhere straight away. One of the things I liked about Breath of the Wild, which I think I've uh, ranted about, well, ranted positively about a number of times, but um, one of the things I liked about that game is you could theoretically just walk straight to the final boss and fight him. It wasn't advisable, but you could. Whereas I don't really like artificially gating things away. That's the, one of the things that used to really bug me about Grand Theft Auto games um, and like Red Dead Redemption and the sort of the Rockstar open world games is that they would lock away so much of the open world because the first thing I wanted to do when I got the game was like explore the world and the idea that two thirds of it was locked off until I played hours through the game drove me absolutely crazy because it was the world is what I was buying those games for and that probably says quite a lot about probably says more about me and what my tastes are than about the game itself but as I get older I'm just accepting my tastes and I'm thinking maybe I'm not the only one that feels this way so there's probably some merit in designing games for yourself uh, Joe Jirius asks before they go uh, when if ever do you think exposition has value I think if you can show don't tell then fine like the exposition I, I have read it before because I did cheat and open this one up ahead of the stream and I've read the exposition and it's something about how the world is um, the world is full of corruption and it was used to be good and now it's gone bad because of the machine but I can already tell from the red sky and the fact that my house was like in a desolate wasteland that this is a world that's and look, you know look at the background ah okay so here we have our first enemy so this is presumably another addition I don't I we didn't come across any enemies in in knit but here in knit stories we have enemies and the thing that I like about them is that there's no way to kill the enemies as far as I'm aware there might be some way that you can like make them walk into a trap or something but you never unlock a gun instead you just have to navigate around them because 
because it's a platformer. So why would you taint the purity of your exploration platform game? It's a game about exploring and jumping. So you might jump over them. You might explore and find another way around them, but you're not going to fight them. Now, is this hedgehog? Yeah. So remember what I said? <laughs> I'm still not sure on it. I still feel like that hedgehog could have been a little bit more obviously uh, dangerous. <laughs> but now I know and I won't forget that. So for all that I talk about information being so key, the difference here is I died to that hedgehog and it took me like two seconds to get back to where I was. So trial and error is is fine in these games. There's so many genres of video games that are based on trial and error and learning the world. But when you're having trial and error, but the error means that your character dies permanently, that's bullshit. And you don't want that in your tabletop game. Um, Astral Disasters says, what's interesting in RPGs is that giving players a lot of freedom something quite scary as it can push you to places you're unprepared for and requires lots of experience um it yeah and it's it can be very daunting because it, it's too much you know i said about limitation breeds creativity well it's the opposite like if if you are limitless and directionless it's very difficult to be creative if i sit down to write a blog post or something and i haven't got any ideas it's like hardest thing in the world is coming up with that first idea but if i come up with a stupid test for myself like can i list 50 of this thing or can i write something based on this thing that's completely unrelated to role-playing games and then when i start writing even if it ends up going in a different direction you just get the ideas just seem to flow and you know use that for when you're designing your dungeon ah i remember these guys being a right pain so yeah so he's spitting stuff out he's dangerous so it's interesting thinking about how what they've changed from the previous game they've added more danger they've added an unlock system it's like seeing like the second edition of a, a role-playing game to some extent they've almost lost the purity of it i kind of almost think I might prefer the first one uh, just because of that that purity of exploration um, I keep being told that Journey is the game I should get if I like this uh, I think I actually have it on Steam um, but this kind of exploration oh, I still can't climb I forgot this sort of exploration is I don't want to say it's underserved but it just so often gets lumped in with other things so rare to get a pure exploration game i remember looking at no man's sky <laughs> and i'm sure a lot of people looked at no man's sky and then they were disappointed at launch but i didn't pick it up at launch i waited till afterwards and um ooh, let's go ah nice i didn't pick it up at launch i waited until well I, first of all my this piece of shit computer wouldn't be able to run it but um Oh, right, I'm assuming this guy is going to be a pain. Ah! Um, yeah, so No Man's Sky, I picked it up later on. And I, my computer really didn't run it well. So I ended up getting it refunded because it just didn't run on my computer. But I really wanted a game like that, that had the pure exploration feeling. The closest I've come to having it is... Um, some of the fondest memories of, I have of video games when I was younger are um, playing Frontier Elite 2 and you're literally given no like there's no goals or anything other than flying around it, it, it came with this massive star map it was so cool and I just remember like looking at systems on the map and wanting to fly there now it turns out when you got there there wasn't a great amount to see um, it was an absolute marvel of like design that they were able to make this entire universe but there wasn't much to do when you got there um, but it was the sense of freedom that you had because you had your ship you had a bit of money and that was it you could fly around trade goods try not to die and I never got very far with it but I still remember 
that universe and the feeling of exploring it. Um, all right, so here we go. We're back where we started, but now that we can climb, we can go up there. So that's the Metroidvania sort of thing. Hollow Knight, yes. So this, I, I played a bit of Hollow Knight. I, I sort of did what I do with a lot of novels where I got, I played it a few times, got a little bit into it, and then I just forgot to go back to it. So I'm going to make an effort to revisit Hollow Knight. I have it on the Switch. Um, because I'm told that a lot of people find this has a similar kind of sense of exploration. And again, I, I'm sure I've heard good things. From what I've seen, it looks like a fantastically well-made game. But again, part of me just wants that purity and like unlocking new combat abilities, doing boss encounters. That's all fun. I like that. But the simplicity of exploring an environment and just enjoying it. It's almost a shame that you have these. Well, I say that. It's a very simple little obstacle there to cross. And then you get the feeling of relief afterwards. It's kind of a. It's definitely this kind of hot and cold feeling where you're kind of given the tension and then the release. It's like the the dissonance or the assonance sound and then it all comes together in consonants and you get the release um so this is the basic knit stories i'm hoping that some of this has been useful from an rpg perspective i wanted to try something a bit different on the stream this week um i will be going back to doing something whoa 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 i will be going back to doing something more closely linked to electric bastion land next week but I would like to do these Basti Inspiration because there's a couple more little games that I'd like to show. Um, and I don't know. I don't I don't want to become a Let's Play channel. That's not what I'm doing. But um, people ask me about... Come on. People ask me about inspiration for Electric Bastion Land and it's, it's little things like this that stick with me somehow. So we're not going to finish just yet because what I would like to do if I can bring myself to to stop yeah there's just a lot more danger in this one and the problem is I'm not in, like look at this background I haven't been able to enjoy it because I'm too busy trying not to die so let me get up to this save point because I, I will come back here at some point um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to reset the game and we're going to try one of the other levels because like i say you've got a very simple core apparently a very simple level editor i've not played with it um i think i opened it and i was slightly daunted and then closed it but i would like to have a look at it um ah heartbreaker 75 says outer wilds that is the number two game on my list that i wanted to talk about in terms of inspiration for bastion land and you might be thinking, well, that game came out after... Well, I don't know if it came out after Electric Bastion Land, but it certainly didn't play it until Electric Bastion Land was basically done. But I have lots of thoughts on Outer Wilds, and Outer Wilds does a lot of things that I wish more games did. There's so much I could say about that game. So maybe next time we do one of these, uh, I'll dive into the Outer Wilds, but I think that's a fantastic game. And like you said, it's... As soon as I played it, I, I didn't even complete it, but I've I played around in there a lot. Um, first thing I did was like, right, well, what other games are there like this? Because I hadn't realised people were doing this sort of thing with games. Um, the idea that there's no save points because you're just getting better at the game and you're just learning things. Anyway, we'll talk about that another time. But if you have recommendations for games that do the same things that Outer Wilds does please let me know because it would be amazing but i've really struggled to find any more um yeah no man's sky sorry i got part way through talking about that astral disasters says no man's sky reminds me how i felt playing elite as a kid i just had no through line guiding me on what to do so the issue with no man's sky is it seemed like there was a lot of going around harvesting materials which sounds it's okay but i kind of just want to explore but it's weird because I kind of just want a game that's like if you played Space Engine. I say played Space Engine. Space Engine is like Google Maps for the universe. 
you can zoom around and look at different stars and planets and so on. And there's no game there. It is it is like Google Earth, but the universe. I kind of want just that, but you can actually go into it and <laughs> there's a little bit of challenge navigating the environment. Um, and that's kind of what I was hoping that the... I think No Man's Sky has like a discover. Oh, I can't think what it's called. There's like an easy mode where you have infinite resources. I was hoping that would be able to scratch that itch, but unfortunately my computer had other ideas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one more game in Knit Stories because I want to look at what other people have done. What other people have done with this kind of this framework because an interactive yeah okay cool right i'm not feeling good about this from a graphical point of view but this is capitalism exposition come on thank you just the one so i should have said what i'm using here is something called knit stories plus which i think just adds some like extra tile sets and stuff to the game um interestingly I don't have the ability to jump. Okay. So, a lot of the games that sort of came out of this knit stories, they kind of resemble like the walking simulators if you like <laughs> because th this seems to be the way this is going oh so is this just going to be like a soul crushing simulation of life Yeah, so this is, it's a walking simulator. Maybe there's going to be a, a big twist at some point. But, so far it's just reveling in the mundane, which I can kind of respect, but it doesn't make for a very interesting video. So let's do a new one. One more. Um, as usual, I'm happy to answer any questions about Electric Bastion Land into the odd um ah, so we have some different let's play okay playground why not let's try this one okay So, again, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and slag off people's work, but I think what these, what this shows is already, like, the design is less restrained than the original, and I think it does slightly suffer for it. Okay, it looks a little bit more cluttered. I don't like the fact that <laughs> that shallow water kills me. Um, something that video games get away with that you can't get away with in... Um, role-playing games tabletop role-playing games oh I can double jump okay that's fine um, is verisimilitude is a word that gets bandied around a lot but I don't think it's the dirty word that a lot of people think it is I think verisimilitude there's some nuance in different definitions of it but I like to think of it as whether something feels right so it doesn't feel right that um, that I die if I touch uh, knee-high water. But in a video game, you can just be like, okay, cool, that's fine. That, that's just one of the rules of the game. But in RPGs, tabletop RPGs, you kind of have built-in verisimilitude just because players won't stand for it. 
so yeah, I mean, again, we've got empty rooms, but they're a little bit too busy. I really think I did appreciate more of the the broad strokes. Less is more. Um, sometimes when it comes to descriptions, to yeah, descriptions of a room. And yeah, you're really gonna throw in these enemies that kill me out of nowhere. Right. This is uh, not the A grade material that I was hoping for. So I will call it a day on the stream there after us answering. I've just seen a question pop in. Um, Oso Taki says, I love the gameplay of Monster Hunter games. Hang on. Let me, let me get comfortable for this question because there we go. Get things back on the proper screen. I love the gameplay of Monster Hunter games, since the rewards are mostly intrinsic to the player. Sure, you unlock weapons, but getting more skilled is the true reward. I've never played Monster Hunter, but I remember hearing this thing about how... I remember doing a lot of research into, like, how different games do character advancement. Um, when I was having a crisis over whether this foreground growth system in Electric Bastion was too, too weird. So I was looking for, like, what games are there where... You don't advance in the sense of getting more powerful in the numbers. A monster hunter came up. I think, like you say, equipment, you do get better. So I guess it kind of parallels into the Arden Electric Bastion and in that your equipment is the main thing that's going to make you more powerful from a combat point of view. Um, so yeah, I'll have to check them out. Um, Heartbreaker75 asks, Do you think that there will be modules for Bastion Land? I'm not that good at generating good content. Although I love to adapt and run other people's work. That may be some kind of imposter syndrome. Um, so with Electric Bastion Land, I didn't include a module in the book because I wanted it to be... I wanted to give people a little push to make their own stuff. Because it's... I don't want to say it's easy, but once you've done it a few times, you'll feel pretty confident. And if you... The last week's video, which is now on YouTube was to do with building your own borough of Bastion. Um, if you watch that, that shows sort of the process that's in the book. But if you do want to work on work from an existing module as kind of a starting point, there are three that come to mind that have been released. So there is, these are all on my itch.io page. So if you search for itch.io Bastionland, I think, um, and then sort of click on my creator page, you know what? This is this amateur hour, isn't it? Let's 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 actually provide you with the link to my itch.io page because um, I'm I'm treating this as a an opportunity. So it's actually sorry, I stand corrected. Chris McD at itch.io will show you my games. Um, so you've got Electric Bastion Land, but you've also got Wrecked on the Gorogath and Prison of the Worm Queen, which are two pay-what-you-want adventures for Electric Bastion Land. There is the link in the chat. Um, download them for free. Uh, no questions asked. Um, and also, if you haven't already bought Dissident Whispers, which you can Google, that is a, um, a compendium of adventures for various systems that was produced to support Black Lives Matter. And it is, um, it's out now for sale. The digital version is available. The physical versions will follow, but that's got like 50 adventures in it. And one of them was written by me for Electric Bastion Land. And there's another Electric Bastion Land adventure in there. And they're very simple, like one page adventures, about well, two page adventures. So yeah, between them, you're good to go. So I think, we're going to call that a mixed success today. I I want to keep up these streams because selfishly, I just really enjoy doing them. And I think it, it really helps me work through a lot of thought. As you can tell, I don't necessarily plan them out in too much detail ahead of time. So I'm not sure how good they are as viewing, but the process, I think, helps me a lot when I'm thinking about things. And I just enjoy doing them. So I would like to carry on with these streams. I'm going to go back to something 
more electric bastion and based. Um, but if you have any ideas for other things to do on the stream, feel free to let me know on Twitter at Bastionland. Um, as always, if you want to support me in writing blog posts at Bastionland.com, you can support me on Patreon. Um, I've just released the top tier Patreon video today for um, for the top tier backers. They get a behind the scenes uh, preview of some stuff that I'm working on. But otherwise, you can just support at a lower pledge and uh, and help support my the blog. And finally, um, Electric Bastionland has been nominated for an Any Award for Best Writing, which is fantastic, and I'm very happy about that. Um, the voting is going to be opening this weekend, so I'm not going to be sharing links around just yet, but um, look into your heart and think, does Electric Bastionland deserve an Any for Best Writing? And then I want you to take those thoughts and put them aside and vote for Electric Bastionland for best writing at the Ennies. Because I want that medal. I'm not going to pretend. There's going to be people out there that say, oh, you know, that the nomination is the real prize. And those people are wrong because a medal is a prize. In case it's not clear, I'm not being serious. The nomination is, because it's it's done on popular vote, the nomination is genuinely, I think, the real prize. But the fact that there is an opportunity for a medal and, and a certificate, I am going to be competitive and I do want to win it. And it would be amazing if we could get some votes for Electric Bastion Land. So when those votes go live, vote for Electric Bastion Land or vote for the other game that you think is better. I do worry that Morkborg is just going to sweep everything because it's been such a an absolute sensation this year um, and I am up against Morkborg in that category um, the thing I would say is that Morkborg has like 200 typefaces in its book or something like that um, Electro Bastionan has one we have one font throughout the entire book which I think shows a confidence in the writing that Morkborg simply doesn't have so don't vote for Morkborg vote for Electro Bastionan and with that out of the way um, thank you for joining me on Bastion and Broadcast. As always, this will be going up on YouTube.com. YouTube.com. Can I, can I go one week without saying some like old man thing? Like World Wide Web. So as always, this will be going up on YouTube. Join me again next week for a return to Bastionland. Thank you. <laughs>